So without further ado, I introduce our rhymers. Good day, good day. Well, perfect, sir. Thank you. I think they're. Uh, I, I've been nominated to speak first or to chat or whatever. Uh, rhymers. Yeah, group. Ken drew the short straw. <laughs> I didn't nominate them. <laughs> no one voted. I didn't even see the ballot. <laughs> uh, this is the quality entertainment. <laughs> uh, let's see. We all get together every two weeks in a, which sounds great, which is nice, an international group of rhyming storytellers. Um, in Newfoundland, we have a tradition of doing that kind of stuff, and we, we call them recitations, so rhyming stories, usually humorous, but not always. And so when the pestilence started and uh, things went online, um, well, I was missing some of the storytelling, and we did have our St. John sessions, but uh, I was, I really enjoy the rhyming stories. So I came up with the idea of having a Zoom get together just for rhymers. And between the jigs and the reels, and there were probably more jigs than reels, um, I managed to uh, meet this person and that person. And, and on our private face group now, I think we're up to about 25 people. And these are all funny, funny people. Uh, and and the, the best of the best couldn't make it. So um, we're here. And uh, I want to talk a little bit, I suppose, about what we do. And then we'll share a few stories. Um, it was around last June, I think, was our first meeting. And uh, so right now we've got people, we've had people come, let's see, Australia, Ireland, England, Scotland, United States, Isle of, oh, Isle of Man, Isle of Wight, oh, sorry, that's, yeah, got to get the right island, Isle of Wight, which is just off the coast of England, that's Sandy. And uh, well, anyway, maybe Harry, if you want to explain a little bit about the history of recitations and how we got into it, and then Bruce, I suppose, can talk a little bit about his rhyming history. Sure, yeah. Well, here in Newfoundland, um, Newfoundland years ago was uh, the primary, uh, primary occupation was fishing. Um, so we had uh, in small outport communities all around the coastline, there were many, um, many little fishing stages. Well, a stage, I guess, if you took a, a shed and you uh, built it onto the end of a wharf, um, that would be co considered your fishing stage. That's where you'd clean your fish when you brought them in and, and whatnot. So all these fishermen will go out, get their daily catch, bring them in, and spend hours uh, cleaning their fish on the wharf. And over a little ways from him might be another guy 10, 20 feet away. It could get kind of boring years ago and nothing to do. So they make up little rhymes that... Uh, Kind of maybe comedic to torment your buddy over across the way, or 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 maybe poke fun at him a little, and um, that eventually uh, became uh, advanced, I guess, into um, into uh, uh, parties. Like a, uh, most parties in, in Newfoundland years ago happened in the kitchen. There were always big kitchens. Everybody sat around, had a great time, lots of musical instruments and whatnot. And that was adapted. The recitation was adapted into that environment as well as yes, you get kind of like hey jim tell tell dave what 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 you were saying about him down on the wharf the other day and then they tell a little story and everyone would laugh you know it's kind of a kind of a, that's kind of the way it would work and eventually i guess it it, uh, it went from the fishing stages to the concert stage and, and they're performed uh, widely now that's uh that'd be my take on it from there uh from newfoundland side of things uh, Bruce, maybe uh, yeah. how recitations happen around your way. Well, it's not part of the culture where I am. I was some of, somewhat of an outlier here in, in New England. And I didn't know that there was this place called Newfoundland where this was going on for hundreds of years. It was just something I did all my life. I didn't know any better. And I had <laughs> few role models and when the pandemic came on and I met Ken Parsons and we formed this international rhymers group, lo and behold, this rhyming thing is called recitations, which at first sounded a little formal to me, kind of like regurgitation. But I found out that it was a, a time-honored and widespread 
tradition in many places and I felt like I had found my my spiritual brethren there in Newfoundland and Ireland and England and it's been uh, one really bright spot in the in the pandemic it's uh, when, it, when Harry mentioned stage uh, it literally uh, Harry has been performing with a, uh, a recitation group called From Stage to Stage. And if you followed Harry's story, from the fishing stage to the performing stage. And uh, From Stage to Stage has been around 10 years now, Harry? Yeah, we're on the go 10 years. Yeah. Yep, yep. And, and I can honestly say, part of the, one of the main reasons I sort of got into it was that I can remember a story I heard on the radio I won't say years ago, but about fog, when Dave Padden did his story about fog. And I, I didn't know it was Dave Padden or what it was. I thought it was just a great story and eventually learned about it. And now, well, Dave's part of Harry's stage to stage group and Dave's part of a rhymers group. And uh, I, I won't say fell into it, but I, I've learned about it and become very interested because I've been only at it for about three years. Harry, for how many years have you been doing this, Harry? I don't remember. <laughs> uh, writing, writing uh, for the past say nine years, but I've been at it since I was about fifteen years old, telling stories from from various performers that I've heard myself. Yeah. And Bruce, you've been writing rhyming stories for how long? Decades. Yes. Oh my God, every week, every time Bruce has got something new, and it's usually something I've wrote this oh back in whatever date and whatever time and yeah bruce has a lot of stories but maybe we'll 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 share a few stories and if anybody's got any questions you can post them in the chat or uh let us know and uh so we'll have a go around my favorite story uh is about my wife's grandmother and when i say it's a true story it's not um but it's true to me, so how about that? But this is called uh, Nan Blunden's Pantry. See, Newfoundland and Labrador are those kind of places where people come to escape and give up their races. But not long ago now, we did have one spot uh, where no one escaped nothing and a, a battle was fought. See, in the town of Raisin Arm, when provisions are scanty, nobody's allowed in Nan Blunden's Pantry. Uh, but the pantry is open. It's not locked anymore. But I, I'll tell you the story about what happened before. See, it was Nan's old orange tomcat. Uh, now he's dearly departed. Uh, but he is the reason all these shenanigans started. Just a round the bay tomcat. Every bay has the same. <laughs> Nan loved that old cat, but she never gave him a name. Uh, he just did what he wanted. He came in and went out. He was uh, the kind of a cat that's got to run of the house. Now, uh, this is not some spry creature like some fit mountain climber. No, no, he, he was more like a, a potato uh, or a sofa recliner. Uh, and he's not a fast feline who can slither and slinker. He's more of the cat that's a, well, a sitter and thinker. And Nan kept that cat food up, well, high on a shelf. <laughs> and there was no way that that cat could get it himself. Uh, but one afternoon now, he just wanted a snack. And it was just, well, Purity Factory's products on that lower rack. <laughs> Sure, he ate a whole bag, or, or maybe two, or hard bread, and that's when he got that purity taste in his head. See, from that day on forward, if his heart was beaten, <laughs> it was just purity products it was all he was eating. Nan went for crackers, you know, for when company comes. And she went into the pantry and, nope, not a one. And she couldn't make any Newfoundland fish and brews, because uh, there was no bit of hard bread around for to use. So as... Stuff started to vanish. Oh, Nan got right vicious. Uh, first her hard bread and her cookies and, and then her own candy kisses. So Nan had enough. She put on a bolt and a lock. But around the bay, Tomcat is not easily stopped. Uh, see, the very next day, that old cat, he gained entry. And he who who deenied his way into Nan Blunden's pantry. And to make matters worse, oh, just to be a tormentor, he went through every jam jam cookie and licked the jam from the centers. <laughs> so then Nan turned that pantry into an impenetrable vault and she made sure that cat's antics were brought to a halt. Sure, uh, she put on bolts and big chains from ceiling to floor and, and if you look down, 
you could make out she, she built a secret trap door. And there was a dirty big padlock. And if you don't know the code, well, the, the Bombay door's open and down you go. See, to protect her provisions, oh, she'd take on any man. Those Japanese ninjas got nothing on them. It's um, Mission Impossible for Crackers. Uh, that's the description I'd use. But we're not talking about some fit feline Tom Cruise. <laughs> oh, no. That cat just set ball it. And boys, what a sin. It was the constant meowing because he couldn't break in. So Nan had enough. She let out a roar and that cat shuddered and shook and then fell dead to the floor. I wish you were gone. Well, she didn't mean that and it wasn't her plan to make away with the cat, but the old cat was dead. He, he had died with the fright. Well, Nan felt so bad, uh, she took all the locks down that night. You see, that, that big vault that she created around all of her food had, would have killed her poor cat now and ruined her mood. And she went to bed early, her cheeks were all wet, and, you know, she cried as she slept over the loss of that pet. And the very next day, well, 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 something looked odd. <laughs> sure, it, it looked like the pantry door was abroad. Yes, so it was. Sure, Nan had been robbed. Uh, the shelves were all empty. Who would do such a job? They ate every cracker, every cookie and crumb. And they chewed every candy with the butter and rum. They drank all the syrup, they ate all the jam, sure. Who down the arm would do this to Nan? Was there someone that vicious that would sneak in and pray and go take advantage of a grieving old maid? <laughs> Poor Nan was in shock. Sure, what now could she eat? But who's that on the sofa, covered in crumbs, half asleep? Sure, it's her old orange tomcat. Sure, sure he was alive. <laughs> See, to get into that pantry, he faked his demise. <laughs> well, Nan wasn't angry. She was one happy missus and didn't care if the cat ate the cream crackers or kisses. She was just glad now to see her old friend. And those purity biscuits, well, she'd get born again. Uh, but boys, what a story. Uh, all the newspapers read, Raise an armed tomcat, fakes being dead. <laughs> and up at purity factories, uh, the boss, uh, that's Mr. Pratt, well, he sent out a truck full of goodies when he heard about that. Old Nan was right pleased. And with the cat's recent fame, well, she decided now it was time uh, to give that old cat a name. Uh, she christened them um, uh, nobody, uh, not because affections are scanty, uh, but now <laughs> nobody's allowed uh, in Nan Blunden's pantry. Absolutely true story. <laughs> and and a, a final verse I wrote later on to that was that if... Uh, if a few crackers go missing off Nan Blunden's plate, <laughs> she don't care. Uh, they're the ones that nobody ate. <laughs> now, Harry, my son, I know you've got a good one. If you want to uh, uh, share a story, I think these people would love to hear it. I figure so I'm going to share one, maybe two or three. <clears throat> Bit of time today is over. Um, and thanks so much for having us, guys. Uh, I, I, I got in on the last one, and uh, I... I know I just watched, I didn't participate, but uh, great fun, great fun, and, and thank you so much. Um, I'll, uh, I get a lot of my, um, my uh, uh, inspiration, I guess, from uh, things that happen and just life in general, I guess, family things and whatnot. Uh, one, of the, one of the things I'll share, you know, I, uh, I had a good, a good friend of mine um, uh, wanted me to try, I always loved hot, spicy foods. I don't know if any of you do, but uh, I I tell you, I love the spicy foods, but I don't so much anymore. And there's a reason for that. And I'll, I'll share that with you now here uh, with a little something that I call hot sauce. Allow me to relate a story that's spicy. I don't mean romantic or anything dicey. So don't mind the youngsters, don't cover their ears. Is a story of hot sauce that brought me to tears. You see, whenever asked, do you like hot stuff? I assumed him in food, said yes, can't get enough. Is that is a fact, what I'm saying is true. 
She said, by the time I was 10, I used Tabasco and stew. And they came to peppers, what a wonderful taste. When your mouth starts to burn and red turns your face. Well, I continued on for a few years or more with hot wings and chili and hot sauce galore. And then a friend of mine said they got these new things, spiciest ever, called insanity wings. We were a little intrigued, I said they can't be that bad. So I found a location, yes they had to be had. Well I walked in and sat down at the table I chose, when a waiver, waiver was shoved right under my nose. Oh no thank you sir, I don't want to sign, that's probably for tourists, so you can keep mine. Oh no, said the waiter, you have to sign first. So reluctantly I did, but I'm sure I've had worse. And then he proceeded to tell us the tale of 10 people or more, both female and male, who tried these wings. They still come here all right, but two guys and three girls have all lost their sight. And one young fella ate three while half soused, and he lost the skin from the roof of his mouth. And another young fella, I don't remember his name, he hiccuped after lunch and sat the table ablaze. Well, I didn't flinch. I said, this must be lies, so bring on the food. I'm getting hungry, I cried. Well, not long after that, to my table appeared a man in a suit, like the NASA crowd wears. Well, he set on the table an assortment of things, plus a gallon of milk and the insanity wings. He said, you might want to eat that other stuff first and drink half the milk. Yes, prepare for the worst. Well, I started in. There's no time like the present as the waiter and staff backed into the kitchen. Well, I could see them all peering from the window inside as I swallowed the first bite, my eyes opened wide. I couldn't feel a single thing on my tongue, and not only that, my lips were all numb. But I said I won't let these wings get the best of me, so I took a deep breath, and I gobbled down three. Well, my vision went funny, and I started to shake. I couldn't feel my fingers or half of my face. So I went to the washroom for further inspection, but my lips looked like they had Botox injections. And the strength of the sauce was making me cry, so then a huge mistake. Yes, I wiped my eyes. Oh, how they burned as they almost swelled shut. And I was sure that the lining was burned from my guts. So as I stood there in pain and also half blind, I took a cramp in the stomach and then my behind. Now what happened next? I'll spare you detail. I'll leave that much out and get back to the tale. So back to the table to pay for the meal. Yes, $48, what a hell of a deal. So let's take a look at what I got for the cash, well, eyes, well, lips, and a permanent rash. And my cast iron stomach is now all burnt to cinders and I can hardly sit down because my backside has blisters. Well, it's been quite a while now since all this transpired and when it comes to hot food, well, I guess I've retired. No spices for me now, I can't handle the taste. Sure, all my sauces are now Alfredo based. And I can't look at peppers, neither green nor red. And with the thought of chili comes a pain in the head. So now if anyone asks me, do you like hot stuff? I say, no, thank you kindly. I think I've had enough. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Harry, that's deadly, boy. That, that's wicked, yeah. I can still, I've heard that story lots and lots of times, but it always gets me. I can imagine, because you had the insanity wings, right? Yes, I have, actually. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't be able Terrible. to. Terrible. Terrible. Yeah. <laughs> Don't I, recommend it anyone. No, no, well, I'm coughing. I'm just thinking about it. That bad, I had to put it in rhyme. <laughs> well done. Uh, Bruce, we'll turn when, to you. When life hands you lemons, make recitations, right? Yes. All right. Well, thank you. For, the, for those of you who might be in a romantic mood, I'd like to share with you a piece that I call Edwin and Maggie, A Romance. Edwin McBride wasn't always one-eyed. He was born with two like most any man. As far as he knew, he would always have two, but fate sometimes makes its own plan. He was, making, he was walking one day while making his way across his village's wide, tidy green, when there, near the edge, he spied by a hedge the most lovely, young, bright, red-haired being. The being, of course, was Maggie O'Rourke, the village's gunslinging pride. She could shoot out the eye of a passing housefly. Men wooed her, but failed, and some cried. She heard then a fly and saw it whiz by, but she did not see Edwin McBride. She whipped out her pistol and, whoosh, slick as a whistle, blinded that fly on one side. The fly's eye now gone. The bullet sailed on, as some bullets I want to do. That poor, poor housefly had no more right eye. And Edwin McBride did now, too. Um, 
terribly sorry I made you so gory, said Maggie, now practically cheerful. I wasn't aware that you were right there. I'm generally rather more cheerful. Tis nothing, said Ed, as her scent filled his head, though his ears clanged like two belfry ringers. His eyebrows were singed, his nose slightly twinged, and his vitreous ran through his fingers. Now, how could Edwin just stand there and grin, you may wonder, and be at a loss to fully explain how he smiled through the pain and seemed not the slightest bit cross? You see, Cupid's arrow had flooded his marrow, just as Maggie's wild shot struck his eye. And for her part, Maggie's sharpshooter a heart took aim at Ed and bullseye. Thus came romance. She taught him to dance. And though he cut an awkward figure, she cherished in such Edwin almost as much as she, enjoyed, as she adored pulling a trigger. One day by the sea, Edwin dropped to one knee, held a diamond ring out in one hand, and sang a proposal like a garbage disposal as the ocean waves danced with the sand. Said he, dear, dear Maggie, won't you please marry me? I promise we'll earn lots of loot. I'll promise I'll earn lots of loot. We'll live in a hut with a lovable mutt. We'll have six kids and teach them to shoot. She said, okay. So they wended their way to the church where they spoke with the preacher, who flatly refused to marry the two, for he was a most righteous creature. I'll not wed a guy with only one eye. Of that, he told them, I'll have none. And twas sin, he said, for someone to wed a lassie who wielded a gun. In vain they tried, cajoled him, and bribed with a sleek brand new cross that they bought him to persuade that priest to say, maybe, at least, but he refused, so Maggie shot him. Then they crossed the border where at gunpoint did order a preacher to join them, tis said, then lived happily with not one enemy, for Maggie had shot them all dead. Edwin and Maggie, a romance. Thank you. True story. <laughs> oh, they're all truly stories. Yes, yes. I, I like the the. Uh, oh, maybe I'll share this one. Um, the idea of um, urban legends, right? So we're saying it was a true story. The, this one, and then some of you guys have heard it before, I think. Um, this one is not an urban legend. This is a rural legend. And uh, I, I, I always thought it was Harry, but it wasn't Harry. It was someone else. I had asked the question, well, what's an urban legend? Uh, uh, what would be a rural legend? And uh, the response was, uh, lies. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I, I, I fit in that category, tall tales. And uh, is it not too long? A shorter one, but this is a fun one. Um, about an aircraft carrier, and I don't mean to make out the Americans as the bad guys. This is just how the, the, the cookie crumbled. It's just a story. Uh, passing by the Newfoundland coast uh, was the aircraft carrier, Abraham Lincoln, the, the mightiest warship ever built. Uh, that is according to modern thinking. This monument to technology with a size that's just obscene. Uh, notice the, the, the tiniest little blip uh, upon their radar screen. Well, right away, a note dispatched uh, to the captain on the bridge. Uh, there was a Newfoundland vessel in their path, and it would not move a smidge. Well, the captain took the radio. He said, I I'll straighten this right out. Uh, I'll get them to show us some respect. They'll turn that ship about. Attention, Newfoundland vessel. This is the aircraft carrier, Abraham Lincoln. Your ship is in our path. You must change your course 25 degrees north. And then he sneered and kind of laughed. Well, an answer came immediately as friendly as could be. Uh, oh, good day, my son. How are you getting on? Uh, can you repeat that now for me? Well, the captain of this mighty ship was now somewhat perturbed. Uh, yes, sir, I will change my course. That's not what he just heard. I instead, there was some imbecile in the path of their great vessel, the mightiest warship ever built. Do, do those Newfoundlanders think they're special? Uh, I say again, sir, this is the aircraft carrier, Abraham Lincoln. We're over 100,000 tons. We have 5,000 able Marines aboard, and sir, uh, I am not your son. 
You must change your course immediately. Your ship is in our way, and we have important business in New York. Uh, so now, what do you have to say? Well, again, uh, uh, Skipper Bob from down Raisin Army answered and said, Well, hello. Uh, boys, that sounds like a wicked ship. And New York, oh, sure, what's on the go? Uh, sure, why don't you fellas take a break and, you know, drop down Raisin Arm for tea? So why don't you go ahead and change your course? Uh, we'll open the hall for you at three. Um, but as for our position, oh, and I know you're in a pinch, and, and I would love to help you out, dear boys, but no, 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 we, we will not move an inch. Well, beat red. It doesn't describe that captain's face. He, he, he was ready to explode. In his 40 years of commanding troops, he, he had never been opposed. I demand you change your course, sir. Do not tempt me on this day. We carry enough armaments to, to blow Newfoundland away. Well, so in, in, in perfect Newfoundland sentiment, in a, in a voice that was calm and true, uh, the, captain, the captain got his answer and the response that he was due. Uh, well, buddy, see, see, it goes like this. Uh, Newfoundland's a friendly place. Uh, we just figured you'd drop in for tea and we'd hear some stories uh, from the States. Uh, but as for course correction, well, 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 I'll tell you what you'll do. See, Skipper, uh, we're a lighthouse. Uh, so the next move is up to you. Well, calmer heads prevailed that day upon the bright blue sea. <laughs> and the aircraft carrier Abraham Lincoln... <laughs> Uh, drop down raise an arm uh, for tea true rural legend <laughs> based on a real urban legend you can look it up there are so many stories about a about a an aircraft carrier or a large ship and they argue with another ship and it ends up someone's the lighthouse so uh, it happened here <laughs> harry i'll turn it over to you yes best guy um Sure, I'll uh, I'll do one. I guess um, it was one of the first ones, one of the earlier ones that I wrote. Um, uh, basically, um, it's about uh, one time my eight-year-old daughter asked me a question. I uh, I wasn't quite sure how to answer it, so uh, I had to think on my feet. I had to come up with ways around these things, and uh, but I uh, I think I done okay, and uh, you, you'll soon uh, you'll soon see if I did or not. Uh, it's called uh, Don't Ask. You know, being a parent, sometimes you don't know if you're doing it right, so you go with the flow. Like a little while back, about a month or two, I was fixing the mower, at least trying to, when a small voice behind me made me quite perplexed as my eight-year-old daughter said, Daddy, what's sex? When I realized for sure that this wasn't a joke, I couldn't decide first, I heard a tag or stroke. If this is my daughter and she's only eight, I thought 10 years for sure before a first date, let alone asking questions like this one, you see. It's way too soon for the birds and the bees. Times have they changed since I was that age. Even saying the S word will put that in a rage. But of course I had four sisters, but enough about that. I'll get back to the story. So there I sat. Well, I've been a good dad up to this point, I guess. So I sat down beside her and I tried my best. First I thought, lies, that's the way out of this. You see, my dear daughter, it's a type of a fish. Well, that didn't work. She just looked at me funny. No, no, I meant to say lion, no zebra, no monkey. Well, she called me out and said, Dad, you're not fooling me. I'm practically a grown up. I'm in grade three. Well, the further it went, the worse I got. I stuttered and stammered and cleared my throat a lot. I thought I'd give in now and let it all go and tell her stuff she probably shouldn't know. You see, there's boys and there's girls, and when they like each other, well, they'll grow up to be fathers and mothers. Well, I continued on with some minor detail, but my heart was pounding as she sat there and stared. I even told her to rhyme about the space and the string. You know the one, I remember it, I think. When God made boys, he made them out of string, and he had some left over, so he left a little thing. And when God made girls, he made them out of lace, and he didn't have enough, so he left a little space. Well, I tried my hardest to continue the tale, but I thought it's time to give up. Yes, this time I failed. But before our talk ended, I said, now listen here, miss. Why in the world would you ask about this? Well, she still seemed a little in shock from my words, not expecting a story about bees and birds. 
She said, uh, Mom said to come out. Now listen to us next. She said, supper will be ready in a couple of six. Thank you. Oh, that's a good one. And with that, I'll turn it over to Bruce. Thank you, Harry. You guys are doing all my favorites today. All my favorite ones of yours. Those are so great to hear. Well, this one I think is a, uh, an apt rejoinder to Harry's. It's another tender slice of parental family life that I call Daddy Use the F Word. Daddy Use the F Word. I can't believe my ears. Daddy used the F word, though he claims he never swears. He's never been that kind of guy. I think I'll laugh or maybe cry. I wonder, will God make him die since daddy used the F word? I know I heard correctly, too. He said it very clearly. In fact, he shouted it quite loud as though he meant it dearly. I think he thought he was alone or just forgot to think. Sprawled out in the kitchen with his head beneath the sink. Ah, oh, you've been there too, huh? Yeah. While fixing pipes, his wrench did slip. It spun around, he lost his grip. It hit his face and split his lip. And daddy used the F word. Now sometimes out in public, he knows us kids have heard people use what daddy likes to call four letter words. He says, don't repeat them though, that those terms just confer a weak vocabulary and a weaker character. Which, of course, is why his loud outcry made me stop and blink as it burst upon the household from beneath the kitchen sink. And he would not apologize. My mom, I must alert. As he jumps up and blood runs down his chin and undershirt, he says he's our example. I'd say this time he blew it. Daddy used the F word. Wow. Who knew he even knew it? Thanks. Oh, that's a well, some applause from the back seat. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to know you're still married. This is lovely. <laughs> For now, yeah. Uh, guys, how, how are we doing on time? Uh, Sue or or Dave, if uh, we, we'll do another round of stories, but if, uh, if we got time for longer ones or shorter ones. Uh, Ken, I know that you some of us have heard this before, but can you bring up a story about a lobster? <laughs> sure. Um, uh, yeah, sure. We'll have a little go around. And uh, if you've got any questions you want to know about uh, why in the world we do this. Uh... Ken, yeah. you, yeah, have until, you have until five, uh, 2.15, it looks like. 1.20 to 2.15. Okay, I'm trying to convert that. So 20 minutes. <laughs> 45, 20 minutes. Something okay. like that. Yeah, sure. Well, then we, we can do another round in a few minutes then for questions if anybody's got any. Um, yeah, well, down the street from where I live, I'm in Conception Bay South, which is about 20 miles outside of St. John's, capital city, and 22 or 23 miles from the most easterly point in North America. Uh, and go figure. Wait, wow, there's a seafood shop near where I live. Strange. Outside the front uh, in the parking lot, they put it out in the spring during lobster season, there's a sign that says live and cooked lobsters. But the sign is old and it's worn out and I realized last summer when I drove by you couldn't see half the symbols. So it looked like it said live cooked lobsters. And in my mind the first thing struck me is that that's a tough lobster. So with that the story of uh, Kev the uncookable. Because you, you might think that the tiger is the toughest animal around, or, or it's the elephants, the champion, if you measure pound for pound. But most agree uh, the lion is the king, but uh, no, he's not, sir. The toughest creature that walks this earth is Kevin. Uh, oh, he's a lobster. That's right, a, a lobster that lives down in Ray's and Arm is the king of all the beasts. And whoever you pick for second place, <laughs> don't come near him in the least. See, Kev is a live cooked lobster, and that's a rare creature at that. Sure, you can boil old Kev for hours and hours, and he doesn't feel a tap. Someone said a, a wolverine could bring Kev to his knees. Sure, he wouldn't last a minute boiled in 212 degrees. Sure, Kev's been cooked that many times in water boiling hot, 
and jumps out after an hour. He says, uh, boys, look, uh, you missed a spot. <laughs> now, one enterprising fisherman uh, came down from T. Bon Boyd, and he worked a deal with Kevin. And yes, you heard that right. Uh, a lobster and a fisherman both put their heads together. And they worked out a scheme, went like a dream, as, as smooth as patent leather. You see, that fisherman will sell old Kev uh, over to the grocery store. And then Kev will help his friends escape, so, well, then they'll need some more. But sometimes, sometimes Kev will stick around just for a bit of fun. And then some poor schmuck will buy him and think his supper is number one. <laughs> but after... If you're trying to cook old Kev, and well, many people tried, uh, they'd just give up and throw him back in the sea and go for burgers or some fries. Uh, one fella put him on a barbecue, and he closed the metal cap. Well, sure, uh, Kev was like a sauna. He just stretched out and had a nap. <laughs> and when he opened up the barbecue after, oh, an hour and a half, uh, Kev said, boys, can you close the door? You're, you're letting in the draft. <laughs> so... Even the barbecue crowd gave up and gave old Kev the pass. Because a meal of tasty lobster ain't worth five tanks of propane gas. So nowadays you'll find old Kev, uh, well, cutting big anchors right in half or driving oil rigs out of town. Sure, he, he'll do that for a laugh. And sometimes he'll call up that fisherman if, if ever he gets bored. And he'll jump aboard old Skipper's truck and they'll head off uh, up the shore. Uh, they'll go over to the fish plant. Or, you know, he'll chat up all the girls. And then they'll pack old Kevin's styrofoam and, well, ship him anywhere in the world. So now, the next time you go out for seafood and some big lobster grabs your eye, and then you'd swear to God he winked at you as you were passing by, so, so you, you buy him and you throw him in a pot. But then he gives you one of these. <laughs> well, that means you'll have to boil your water hotter. Uh, then 212 degrees. <laughs> you know, true story. <laughs> it's funny uh, how like sort of themes come out. Like you guys talk about your your kids, or uh, I I have a bunch of old animal related things. Um, oh, it's all fun. Go for it, Harry. Yes, I suppose I will. Um, I'll um, I'll keep on that theme, I guess. I'll uh, I'll, I'll go with an animal one. Um, uh, we uh, here in Newfoundland, uh, moose hunting is uh, is is pretty popular. And to uh, uh, I guess I'll just it not doesn't need much of an introduction. Just that uh, this is probably the oddest case of moose hunting you're ever going to hear tell of. So I just call this one Jerome. Now old Skipper Bill hove off in his chair, he was listening to the stories and lie. The young fellas talking about poaching moose and jigging a few fish on the sly. Well each story told was more far-fetched than the one that came just before. Skipper Bill had enough, said listen now boys, I got a fine tale in store. It was the early 70s, or was it my early 70s? I really can't remember that far. When I took my boat and went out in the pond, I figured I'd stay there till there. With me old bamboo pole and me tub of worms, I ventured a good ways offshore. It was just a small flat, no motor at all, just the tow pins in the gunnels and oars. Well, a half dozen trout was all that I caught, but I really could not have cared less. With the water so calm and sun on my face, I figured it a good time to rest. It's the sound of the birds in the crisp morning air, the gentle wind rustling the trees, and a full day ahead to finish my catch, I decided to drift off to sleep. Then all of a sudden a shotgun blast sure nearly jumped out of my skin. And another one followed right after, and a voice yelling, shooting again. Then out of the woods, like the shot out of a gun, came a moose looking around for protection. Well, he looked all around, he looked up, and he looked down like a CFA looking for directions. Now the thought crossed my mind to grab the oars and head to the other side. But when I looked around, I soon realized they were carried away with the tide. Then the moose left the shore and swam out to me, and here I had nowhere to go. And what his intentions were with me, I didn't think I wanted to know. But it wasn't what you'd think at all as I stared in the face of this moose. He seemed to say, uh, buddy, I need some help. I said, yes, buddy, me too. So then with his rack, he took the painter in tow and he dragged me safe to the shore. 
I said, well, boy, you just saved my skin, so I guess it's now time I saved yours. See, I knew a shortcut back to the truck, and the moose followed close behind. When we got there, I motioned to the pan of the truck, and pretty soon in it he climbed. Led down flat like he was dead, sprawled off in the pan of me truck. Passing by hunters with their guns in their vests, quite jealous of my fortune and luck. Well, back to my home, we arrived soon enough, and I pulled round the back of the house. Soon as the scene that we were alone, I, he quickly hopped up and got out. Well, that was a close one, this moose said to me. That's right before I passed out. Then coming to to realize it wasn't a dream, sure I was gone for another bout. Well, I finally woke up and came to grips and started to regain my composure. I thanked him and said, now be on your way. He said, huh, not until moose season's over. Now to argue with a beast of this monstrous size, I didn't even bother to try. I just cleared a spot in the back of the shed and said, that should do for tonight. But what a commotion at quarter to three that brought me right to my feet. I went downstairs and looked out on the deck at this moose covered up in the sheet. Now, not just the sheet he had wrapped round his head and tangled all up in his points. It was the clothesline and all, with wool socks, pants and bras, all snarled up with patio lights. Well, he lowered his head and he apologized to me. He said, you mind if I came in the house? It's awful lonely out there in the shed. I promise I'll be quiet as a mouse. Well, I let him squeeze in. Perhaps a stunning thing to do. It was a good thing we got double doors. He wasn't in no more than a second and a half before he sprawled off on the hardwood floor. He looked a bit like Bambi on steroids. You know the way Bambi sprawled off on the ice? Well, we finally got him up in the daybed, and with the daybed now nowhere in sight. Well, next morning he was hungry, and I didn't know what to give him to eat. And he didn't like bottles of sweet mustard pickles, and he didn't like bottles of meat. You see, moose are vegetarian, you see, so bottles of meat were no use. I couldn't give him bottle rabbit or tur. Well, heaven forbid bottle moose. So then with his hoof, he pointed out to the backyard. He said, I got a deal for you, Skipper. You won't have the mole for as long as I'm here. Just don't try to feed me them flippers. So with his diet sorted and lodging somewhat, for work I tried not to be late. Around break time I stopped to check the news. There's a moose down Kitty Pitty Lake. Well, it wasn't long before I arrived on the scene with the wildlife officer there too. I said, come on now, buddy. He's just trying to get a drink. It's not like he's in the McDonald's drive through Well, after a while we started agreeing and we figured out what would be best. He's no longer allowed to go parading around town without a huge orange vest. So there you have it. He stayed for a while and everything worked out just fine. He ate the grass in our backyard and we used his antlers for the clothesline. He went back in the woods when the hunters came out, but don't think it all ends there. He became a good friend of the family and sure he comes back every year. A lot of boys couldn't believe it at all. They thought Bill was on the juice. I mean, there's no way in the world that this could be true. I mean, really? A talking moose? Well, Bill just smiled and looked at his watch. He said, I think it's now time I head home. For the last 10 minutes, my ride's been outside. There's a big bull moose named Jerome. Thank you. You go ahead, Sir Bruce. All right, thank you. I, uh, I hope you folks watching this enjoy the Newfoundland lilt and sensibilities as much as I do. I just, I think these guys are, I, I just think the most of these guys and I'm so glad I fell in with them. Well, while we're on that animal theme, I guess, and since Ken started with a cat, maybe I'll lend us off on a cat. This is a, a little piece, a little bit of a different kind of piece. And, and in order to deliver it most effectively to you, by the way, I just want to step back for a second and say, uh, first of all, I apologize for being in my van. I usually try to present myself more uh, with better equipment and uh, more effectively at home, but I'm on the, on the road today with the missus. So uh, appreciate you putting up with me here. And uh, thank you to the Toastmasters group for, uh, for inviting us to come and uh, share our, our little corner of lunacy with you. It, this is real fun. Um, I'm going to go a real short piece, so we'll have a, a five or ten minutes for some, some Q&A at the end. Now, in order to deliver this piece most effectively, I need to get into the mindset of Felinus domesticus, which is my FACO made-up Latin name for the common house cat. So if you'll just bear with me for a moment while I sit here and close my eyes and try to get in that headspace. It's starting to work. I think it is. It's... it's was that a can opener? 
Okay, I'm getting there. I, a little bit more though. I think I need to do it a little bit more. So I'm gonna close my eyes again, sit here and think. Oh, it's getting stronger now. It, it's, it's, I can, my heroes are those guys who go out and round up stray dogs for laboratory research. Did I just say that? Oh man, maybe it's working a little too well. I'm gonna dial it back down a little bit, hold on. Mm. Oh yeah, oh, I love it when you rub my neck. Oh, between my ears, yes. Oh, under the chin, oh, that's wonderful. That's marvelous, that's, 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 that's enough. <clears throat> okay, I think I'm in the zone now, here we go. This piece is called Cat Inside on a Sunny Day. Cat inside on a sunny day, think, wouldn't it be nice, nice, if I could go outside and play? Oh, but front door shut, cat can't get by, stare up at the doorknob, sit right down and cry, cry me, ow, I gotta get outside and scoop me. Ow, nibble grass and puke, puke me, ow. Roam the garden yard and street, hunt me down, a queen in heat. Human come and hear him cry, but he never let him out, out, never let him sneak by. Just can't, can't stop, stop this urge. Never mind, look out, here come kitty power surge. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Zip, zoom from the front to the back, back. Zip, zoom in a second and a half. Zip, zoom from the counter to the floor and back. Listen to the human laugh, 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 laugh. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. We're well, batting at a dancing string. Chase a toy across the floor. Here, bell -ga ding ding slipped in, slide out litter box door. Rolling crunchy litter spilled across the floor. Floor, ooh, ah. A yelling, biting catnip brush. Ooh, ah. Drew the house plant into mush. Ooh, ah. Claw the sofa just a tad. Clap, clap. Uh oh, human, mad, mad. Bad kitty, bad kitty, don't you do that. Stop that right now. Get down from there. Mm, 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 mm. Oh, well, calm now. Chill out. Step and slow. Then a half a can of tuna and a long drink from the toilet bowl. Ooh, rub against the pant leg. Sleepy little whale. And a human hand massage from his ears down to his tail. Tail. Purr, purr. Cozy chair set in the sun. Purr, purr. Business almost done. Done. Per licking tummy, tush, tail, feet, eyes closed, gliding off to hmm. cat inside on a sunny day. Thank you so much. Oh, that's a good one. Right on, Bruce. Very good. <clears throat> Very good. Yeah. You guys are amazing. Several of the comments are like, wow, this is so cool. If you would, anybody who has questions, just put them in the chat and um, we'll ask the guys here as we go. I see a comment here that says, great group. Uh, this is awesome. Lot, okay. Love this. So much fun and creative, but I don't see any questions in there. It's, it's a fun thing to do. Uh, I, I must say we all enjoy it, but uh, we've heard each other's stories probably dozens of times, and I enjoy them just the same as I do the first time I heard them. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but uh, I enjoy that kind of thing. But yeah, we always have fun with, with our group, I must say. I could, I could see how it wouldn't get old. Now, I, actually, I do have a question. When you're putting this together, last night we had David Brooks uh, as our keynote speaker, and one of the things that he talked about was writing your speech out. So based on uh, the, what you've got going on there, I'm assuming that you write your stories out, that it's not just all free verse, and uh, you write them down, and then you go for it. Yes, Harry, you kind of said something a little different about that at the beginning. You go ahead, Bruce. When you're working with rhyme, it really has to be very scripted. So yeah, we do write them out first and then memorize them. And somebody, I saw the, I, a question in the chat, how long does this take to, to do? And it, you really, um, you have to tell it to yourself over and over again a number of times. For me anyway, and when I'm driving in the car, when I'm in the shower, in front of the mirror, and I really have to get inside the piece. Once it's memorized, then I can play with it in front of an audience. 
and have a good time with it. But it, it does, it, it, takes some, it takes some time and effort, I think, to do it effectively. But if you're a writer and you, and you want to rattle off a rhyming piece, you know, it's perfectly acceptable your first time just to stand in front of people and read it, just to get the, get the feedback from that, too. Yeah. So memorization. The inner Dr. Seuss. Yeah. I saw, yeah. I saw another question in the chat, too, by the way. It said, where am I in New England? I am in Massachusetts, a little bit north of Boston. Okay. Someone I mean, uh, just a stone's throw from Newfoundland is ten seconds. Yeah, yes, yes. He's a Newfoundlander, just happened to be born uh, slightly offshore. That, that's that's, that's <laughs> what Bruce is. <laughs> um, we we get together on my YouTube channel, so that's live streamed every second Tuesday. So if anybody's interested, it's called the Liars Bench Show. That's our YouTube channel. Me and Harry do a show together back before. The time of the COVID, uh, but it's called the Liar's Bench. And the, the, the quick story behind that is that there's a Liar's Bench in almost every little outport community in Newfoundland, which is basically where the fishermen get together and tell tall tales about what they caught. Because I, you know, the fish was this big and, you know, some places now it's called a Liar's Bench. Other people, uh, other places it might be Oh, whatever you want to call it, but there's a there's a place where men gather to tell lies. That's a <laughs> well, that's a bar, but there are actual places that have benches that have a name that says liar's bench on it. And I, I, I collect, I've got, oh, I've got about a half a dozen that actually say liar's bench, just pictures and, and lots of places, but yeah. When it comes to memorization, I'll just, this little quick one. The car is the best place, right? So I'm trying to recite and remember. So that story about Kevin at the end where he winks. And like Bruce said, you get into the story. So I'm driving along, stopped at a light. And it gets to that thing where, you know, he gives you one of these. So I lean forward towards the car in front of me <laughs> and realize that they can see me in the rearview mirror. And I hope... <laughs> I don't give someone the wrong impression. So, yeah, careful what you do when you drive. Harry, how do you write? You Go ahead. Oh, it's pretty much the same thing. By uh, you, just, you just sit and write. Some, some come very easily. I find it's, it's uh, and I guess the guys can probably agree, um, when you get a topic in your head and you sit down and you start writing, uh, sometimes it's so simple. It just comes out. And it's so much fun, and you can have a piece written in a matter of an hour or so. Other times, I've I've got a couple that I'm struggling with now. I've been I've been a year with with one on the shelf, uh, trying to uh, come up with the next line. But uh, but when they all happen really quickly, and uh, it's it's a lot of fun. It really is a lot of fun. Harry, a year is nothing. I had one piece. I I wrote the first half, and then then I wrote the second half a quarter of a century later. <laughs> It's fun, but we get a lot of motivation, I think, sometimes, or, or inspiration from each other. We get together, and you hear other people and, and different rhyming schemes. Uh, Sandy, one of the one of the ladies from Isle of Wight, is sort of a syncopated. I can't even describe how she rhymes, but it's not uh, uh, every second line. It, it, it's it's not random either. But there's no, I can't describe it. It's just really interesting. Okay. So, yeah. Ken, would would you uh, be interested in explaining uh, uh, toenail gate? Well, yes. There you go. <laughs> that, that's a good one. Uh, but we 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 bounce stuff off each other, right? So uh, uh, Lance, one of the guys from California, always wears a hat. And so there was one time it happened that he didn't wear a hat. Well, then two weeks later, there was we tore him apart because there was four or five stories all about what happened. Who's this guy? Where's Lance? And who's this guy without a hat? And, and you know, from every angle and, and idea, and from the same old Newfoundland tradition of poking fun at each other, um, I think that <laughs> that's where that came from. But Bruce started the best one, which was the most fun. Oh my blessed! Um, Bruce was interviewed on a, uh, on a Facebook group, uh, Suitcase Stories, and uh, uh, Bruce has been writing stories for years and years. And they talked. They're just interviewing interviewing Bruce. This is a group that raises money with storytelling shows. And Bruce talked about how he had sort of hooked up with this rhyming group, these guys from Newfoundland, and sort of just off the cuff, he mentioned that 
Sure, sure these guys will make up stories about, about anything. Sure, uh, they'll make up stories about toenail fungus. Well, so you know what happened. <laughs> so I can I see what ambushed. happened. I, I was yeah. ambushed at the next meeting, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was funny. So we yeah, had, you know, this has been this has been an absolute treat. Um, I can I can see I can see some of the smiles, but I can sense a lot of others. We really really appreciate you taking your time out of your day, Bruce. Apologize to your wife for us for uh, taking up the time being able to walk on the beach. So get out there and do that, uh, Harry. Thank you so much, Ken. Um, is there? I, I know we've got your link. For your, uh, I know we've got the. Link Ken, for your Facebook site, and we can post that. And uh, where can people follow you guys? Well, our, uh, if you, if, you know, I, I'm not promote, but if you want to subscribe to the Liars Bench channel, then you'll get a notification when we go live with our our, our get-togethers. And it's an informal, it's not a show. It's a bunch of guys like this that we chat and and, and tell stories. And but it's. Uh, the recordings aren't available, so it's only able to watch live, and then we the recordings that are just private with the groups. And uh, if I can mention, Harry's got a book coming out, coming in, in two or three weeks. And um, Bruce, your Bruce have a web? You have a um, a page just for yourself? No, not not yet. I've only been doing this for 30 years. Why should yeah, I have a website yet? I didn't have to, though. Why, why start now, right? <laughs> All right. So if you, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll put a link yeah. to my, uh, my very new author page uh, for Facebook. For, um, uh, that's, that's where, if anyone is interested, they can, uh, they can certainly True. go there and uh, pre-order a copy of the book or, or all the information for contact if you'd like to have one, you know? You well, go. thank you, Harry. And um, everybody, uh, if you would uh, do, turn on your camera, let's give them a nice, warm Iowa thank you and applause. Uh, this was fantastic. Um, see, look at, look at all those happy people. Before, you were just looking at yourself on a screen. I know it's not as fun. 